element to the efforts aimed at stimulating the economy. It aims to create sustainable growth and competitive and transformed industry. It is important uh, to South Africa realizing her long-term objective of eliminating poverty, reducing inequality, and creating jobs. Coupled with this is the withdrawal of the MPRDA Amendment Bill from Parliament, uh, which is another step towards creating a regulatory and policy certainty. So the amendments that have been before Parliament since 2013, we have withdrawn them. And uh, in line with the President Ramaphosa's announcement on the decision by Cabinet to withdraw the bill, I have submitted formal requests uh, to both the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Chairperson of the Council of Provinces for the withdrawal. This would mean that uh, the current MPRDA remains applicable, a separate regime for oil and gas is being developed. In other words, instead of taking uh, petroleum and gas as part of the mining industry, we are separating them. We are going to develop a legal framework which is aimed at establishing and developing the petroleum and gas sector in the South African economy. Let me highlight a few points uh, of the Mining Charter. Elements of the Mining Charter 2018, the elements of, the, of, the, of ownership and mining community development are ring-fenced and they require absolute compliance at all times. On ownership is to entrust regulatory certainty for investors and provide security of tenure for investment. An existing mining right holder who achieved the minimum of 26%, including right holder whose BE partner have since exited, uh, is recognized as compliant for the duration of the right. Emphasis, for the duration of the right, not the life of mine, for the duration of the right. And this, rec this recognition is not applicable upon renewal and is not transferable to new owner in the case of the transfer or sale. The Mining Charter 2010 will apply to all pending applications lodged and accepted prior to the coming into effect of the Mining Charter 2018. The right holder uh, will be expected to increase their minimum BE shielding to 30% within five years. In other words, for those applications that have been submitted, not approved yet, we are creating a transitional arrangement uh, for them. A new mining right granted after coming into effect of the Mining Charter 2018 must have the minimum of 30% BE shareholding. Applicable for the duration of the mining right, it shall be distributed as follows a minimum of 5% non-transferable carried interest to qualifying employees. A minimum of 5% non-transferable carried interest to host communities. But for host communities, we've created an alternative, which is a minimum of 5% equity equivalent benefit. Uh, and let me explain that. The reason that we are giving this alternative to mining communities that were still grappling in finding a way of communities exercising their rights of ownership. But we say we are not going to delay them accessing the benefit until that is perfect. So in other words, uh, they were creating an alternative that it is equity or equity equivalent benefit. Now, then a minimum of 20% effective ownership in the form of shares to be entrepreneurs, a minimum of which 5% uh, must preferably be for women. We're using the word preferably for women because entrepreneurship is something that 
you do not create. It is something that is a fire inside the person. It's the person of ideas, it's a person who wants to invest, and there was a preferable women. Now, a charter further outlines requirements for junior miners. That is a mining right owner with a single multiple mining rights, having a combined annual turnover of less than 150 million rand, as well as licenses granted under the Precious Metal Act 205 and Diamond Act 1986, and thresholds for precious metal jewelries and beneficiaries. So that is the provision in, in, in ownership. That's what we have in ownership. Now on beneficiation, to promote beneficiation in line with government policy, a mining right holder may claim the equity equivalent mechanism against the maximum of 5% points of PE and tapnership. A mining right, you will, you will see that we have reduced the 11% uh, set off to 5%. That's what we have done. Because uh, we think that we are putting emphasis on transforming the industry with a strong emphasis on ownership. Uh, a mining right holder must submit to the department a beneficiation equity equivalent plan for approval as outlined in the mining charter implementation guidelines. Then let's go to procurement which is inclusive supply and enterprise development. Procurement of South African manufactured goods and service provide opportunity for expanding economic growth, creating decent jobs, and widening market access to the country's goods and services. In this regard, the latest commitment of 2 billion rand by Kumba is commendable. To confirm local con uh, content, Goods must be procured in line with the standardized product identification coding system being developed by the Department of Trade and Industry. Mining rights holders will be expected to provide proof of local content in the form of certification from the Southern Bureau of Standards uh, or any other entity designated by the Minister. On promoting research and development capabilities, a mining rights owner must spend a minimum of 70% of its total research and development budget on South African-based entities, public or private. Human resource development. Human resource development constitutes an integral part of competitiveness, transformation and sustainable growth. A mining right holder is therefore expected to invest a minimum of 5% of levyable amount, excluding the statutory skills development levy, on essential skills development, including science, technology, engineering, and mathematical skills, uh, graduate training programs, and research and development initiatives. Employment equity. A mining right holder must achieve the minimum threshold of historical disadvantaged persons that reflects the provincial and the national demographics at boards, executive, senior management, middle management, and junior management, core and critical skills, as well as employees with disabilities. We we'll put specific numbers for each of those categories. Uh, more important on this one, uh, it's important to emphasize that in the past, when we use the broad definition of historical disadvantage South Africans. There was a tendency of treating women and then companies uh, accelerated empowerment of white women entities at the expense of the rest. We're going to be paying a specific attention on that. We must empower and transform society in its entirety. Uh, mind community development for purpose of implementing social and labor plans and mine community development projects. The term mine committees refers to communities where mining takes place, major labor sending areas, adjacent communities within a local municipality, metro municipality, and district municipality. A mining right holder must meaningfully contribute towards mine community development with a bias towards mine communities, both in terms of impact and size 
and in keeping with the principles of social uh, license to operate. A trust or similar vehicle which will oversee the implementation of the 5% equity equivalent. Detailed under the ownership element should have a, a minimum representation from host communities and mining committees. The trust will identify community development needs and be responsible for developing a host of community development programs and find distribution, governments, and organization. Now, the use, use of the funds for administrative costs, project management, and consultation of the trust or similar vehicle may not exceed 8% of the total budget. A development program shall not uh, substitute social and labor plan uh, commitments. Emphasis that we're making in this regard is the fact that social labor plan must talk to the uh, IDP of a local municipality so that they don't duplicate developments. They must complement each other so that uh, the collective impact must make a visible change in that community. On housing and living conditions, a, a mining right holder shall be required to submit a housing and living condition plan to be approved by the department after consultation with organized labor and the Department of Human Settlements. Then we go to compliance. Charter requires that mining, mining right holders should submit annual compliance reports to the department. In our engagements, stakeholders, in particular communities, were critical of the department's ability to monitor and enforce compliance. The department is continuing with the process of uh, filling key vacant positions to stabilize critical areas, including monitoring and enforcement of compliance. This is to ensure that we can adequately monitor and enforce the compliance of the charter. That is, in summary, you'll get the charter, read it, do a critical reading of it. Uh, uh, when we were students, one of the things that was very important was what is called a book review, where people write detailed comment and analysis of a document. We're expecting all of you to do that. Uh, it will save us from people who just shout from the rooftops. Now, we thought that it was also important to fill you up on the visit to the uh, provinces over the weekend, because we've read many things from people who are not there. Now, it is important for us to give you a total uh, feedback on that. The past weekend, uh, we undertook visits to KwaZulu Natal, where we visited two mines. And Eastern Cape, we've established a team which uh, will go back to Kwasomkele in KwaZulu Natal. That is the commitment we made over the weekend that, listen, we'll send a team to go back there and listen to that community, write a detailed write up of the issues. And then we do an analysis and we'll be going back there to talk to that community. That commitment we made there and we're fulfilling it. A team is put together and it will be in Kwasom Kele by Monday. Uh, that is a week after we made the commitment. We also visited Tolobeni village in Bizana to listen to concerns around proposed mining in the area. Ten organizations made the representations. The names of those organizations is Mdaja Trust, Bekela Trust, Koloben Development Trust, Amadiba Development Forum, Mzamba Taxi Association, the Eastern Cape Constructors Forum, um, Zolko, Pizana Chamber of Commerce, Amadiba Crisis Committee, and King Zanuzu Gostau of Amambon. Of these, nine were for the development of both mining and tourism. Uh, and one Amadiba Crisis Committee made a presentation against mining development in the area. Uh, this is quite important to us because if you listen to the news, you can think that there was a big fight between us and uh, uh, the crisis committee. 
The reality of the matter is that we allowed everybody to sit in, but we removed from the meeting people who wanted to disrupt the meeting. Because all people were sitting there, listening carefully, and a crowd of almost rendered school-going children uh, with pre-written placards came in and we said to them, sit in, participate, express your views. Uh, when they did, chose not to, but instead to disrupt the meeting, we said they must be removed from the meeting. That is the reality of the situation there. And the meeting went on very well, but even the crisis committee had a representation in the meeting and they expressed their views in the meeting. Now, one of the things we observe there is that what 25 in Pizana, that is where Kolobeni is, is the poorest ward in Pizana. Is the poorest ward in Pizana with the highest level of illiteracy and dependence and high dependence on social grants. And therefore we thought that to deprive such a community right to development is actually injustice. That's our view. The community wants to use tourism and mining to develop itself further. So in, the, in terms of that community, it is not mining versus tourism. It is tourism and mining together and deal with development holistically in an integrated way. That's what they want because they're a poor community, they want to develop themselves, and that's it. And the community wants to use tourism and mining to develop themselves further. It is important that consultation is allowed uh, to proceed uh, peacefully so a final determination can be made on this matter, which is long standing. So we'll continue engaging in that area. People have asked us about the moratorium. The moratorium gave us space to, to engage. That's what moratorium does. And once we think we're happy with the engagement and pe people are happy, we will actually lift that moratorium. It needs to be. Now, there's a story that I had a secret meeting with the company in Australia. Again, that's how bad South African journalism has gone. Uh, now I'm accusing all of you. That's how bad it has gone. Because the, the, the reality of the matter is that a delegation of the DMR went to Australia not to meet a particular company, to a mining in the other equivalent in Australia. It is called Africa Down Under. That's how they call it. Various countries in the continent go to that flag of uh, in Daba, we were there, we talked to everybody, we tried to mobilize investment for South African mining. That's our responsibility. And that's what happened, nothing secret about it, an open forum, big, quite organized, and we loved it. And, and those who have been around for some time, they will remember that it is the same forum where South African delegation were at each other last year. This year when there, there was coherence in our approach and our message as South African mining industry, including the department, mining, junior miners, everybody was there with a coherent message. So a story of some secret meeting is an imagination of one's mind. Uh, I, I don't know why do they create stories like that. Uh, we're going to engage people in Colombia and our view is that we should engage them, talk to all of them, and ultimately find a solution. The area needs development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we will now open up for your questions. In fact, we will take uh, four questions in this first round. If I could ask you to please introduce yourself and the media house you represent. Um, David? Hi, it's uh, David Mackay from Mining MX. Minister, are you uh, confident you've got the resources and the budget to 
put the DMR in a position whereby you can implement this charter. And this is with special reference to your budget speech in which you said the budget was insufficient and also because of the reprioritization of the national budget. So this would be in terms of establishing, you know, being fully staffed, uh, being completely anti-corruption, have fully competent and, and versed people in those roles to make sure that the things you said today can actually be implemented uh, properly. Thanks. We'll take another question. Sam Kele. Sam Kele Masago from ENCA. Uh, Minister, I'm going to trouble with you. I'm going to trouble you with uh, think two or three questions. One would be, why do you think, particularly the mining sector, is so receptive of this mining charter now, since you are at the helm of DMR, especially since we haven't moved from the 30 percent that was proposed by your predecessor, um, Sebin Zizwani. Then, secondly, when it comes to Kolobin, what is actually going on down there in that community? You are saying eight of those community forums or entities were pro-mining in the area. Then what is the view that you have, particularly when you've got political formations such as the SACP through its Deputy Provincial Secretary, Lazo Landamase, who are saying that mining in that area will destroy the land in their area and will destroy their community? And is it true that certain chiefs in the area are being bought luxurious 4x4 vehicles by this Australian company that is supposedly now saying, or a journalist is saying, that company did secretly meet with you in Australia or in South Africa, wherever that secret meeting took place. I don't know if there was any plotting involved. But... <laughs> I, I, was is I was not in Maharani. <laughs> <laughs> but... What is actually going to happen there? Because it seems as if you have decided, or 70% decided, that mining will take place in the area. It's just about ironing out a few nuts and bolts here and there. What is the final decision of DMR on this posture? Thank you. I uh, will take two more questions. Just to indicate that this minister's statement is being circulated, as well as the highlights of the mining charter. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady at the uh, top there. We, hello, uh, Patricia from Reuters News. Just a question, can you please clarify the 5% for employees and for communities? Is that free carry? Could you please clarify that? Thanks. One last question in this round. Uh, the gentleman in the white shirt. Hi, Minister. Greg Nicholson from the Daily Maverick. Oh, she... Oh, sorry. Yeah, Greg Nicholson from the Daily Maverick. Um, the lawyers from some of the mining community groups who took you to court to be a part of this process have said that they believe the community engagement system failed. They say some of the community engagement meetings were held at very short notice, sometimes it was by invite only. Uh, did some things go wrong in the community engagement process? Are you confident that this charter does reflect the views of uh, mining communities? Thank you. Thank you. Minister, when you're ready. Because you are going to deal with technical question. Um, uh, resources are never sufficient. That's why I love the definition of what economics is all about. Economics is about dealing with scarcity and meet, to try and meet inexhaustible human needs. So we can't say we have enough resources, but we've got staffing in the department, we've got the determination, we're repositioning ourselves to be a very effective implementation team. And in our view, with the staff we're having and filling up the posts that are there that are critical, uh, we're going to be able to do so. That's why we're being joined there by the DDG uh, Mineral Regulation. We have filled all the positions of DDGs, which we found acting. Out of five, three were acting. Now we're having full complement at the level of DDGs. So that means we have people who run
the branches of the department now. And I, 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 you don't want to be in that department because we don't have scheduled meetings, say we meet every two weeks. Uh, we meet every time we need to meet and talk about how do we deal with this issue, how to remove this obstacle. So I can tell you that we are going to implement this charter uh, and uh, people will, will feel it, that it is being implemented. We're dealing with corruption. You will know that uh, as we sit here today, the, 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 the office in Pumalanga is closed and, and we're investigating all the leads to that point to corruption. We've done uh, Limpopo. There are quite a number of, of court cases that are in court, and those court cases are based on the evidence that has been collected efficiently. So there's a quiet drive to deal with corruption in the department. Some of my colleagues asked me, why don't you publish this? I said to them, you work better below the radar because there you don't have a lot of noise around what you are doing, but you eliminate corruption in the department step by step. I can tell you that uh, we're talking about a case of a health and safety inspector who sold Section 54. He's no longer in the department. We took a process, he's not there. A person who was actually paying rent to non-existing uh, places is no longer in the department. So we're quite actively and aggressively dealing with cases of corruption in the department. Our view is that we've got the capacity to do so. Uh, why is the mining industry receptive? Uh, only one reason that they're receptive is that we've engaged them and engaged them and engaged them. We talked to them. We didn't relate to them as a boss talking to subordinates. We treated them as equals. We raise issues, they raise their issues. You'll see that the charter, the wedding has been tempered in a number of areas. That is a product of engagement. That's why they are receptive to it. Uh, because in society, people want to be respected. And if you display that respect, they will give you that respect in return. And we're going to continue engaging them. Up to already, we're talking of working together in developing an implementation program for the Charter. Because the Charter will only be successful when everybody involved is part of it. What is going on at Colobini? SACP uh, said uh, mining is against the mining. Lazo Landamasa is staying in uh, uh, Libode, which is not very far from Colobini. Colobini is in Pisana. And I think one of the things that we should always avoid is that people who are holding positions must declare their interest on matters. Simple. They must just declare and not talk as SACP when he is expressing an individual view. In Kolobeni on Sunday, there was no SACP. So uh, SACP that uses a desktop research to express views will actually harm that community. Now, uh, we are going to continue engaging that community. It's not a once-off issue. We're going to engage them. We're going to talk to them. We're going to talk about conditions of mining, which include world-class rehabilitation. And there's an example of where people took them. We said a mining in a mine like Kolobini is rich as bay minerals. We went there, we said, here we are, we're in this bush. Which part is rehabilitated? Which part is original? People couldn't point. And we said, we want that standard of rehabilitation when we do mining there. Because it is on the beach, it must be restored to the original look and shape. At this point in time, you can't talk of any damage of anything there. The place is underdeveloped, badly so. And we're saying, actually, the same crisis committee was against the development of N2. And one of the, 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 the stakeholders were there, made a very important point, said, listen, these people are against N2, N2 is going ahead now, many of them work there. 
and others have companies that have contracts in N2. And he made the point, he said, when we open this mine, I can tell you, Minister, they will be the first to go there and get contracts. So when you deal with a conflict situation, you must be very careful of hearing one story. That's why the question of chiefs who are bribed by the company and so forth, I didn't verify that, I can't vouch for it, will be stories that are flying around. It will be the same as stories like, many of these people no longer stay here, they stay in Port Edward because somebody is funding them. Okay, so those stories must never detract us from focusing on the issue. So our view, our duty is to focus on the task at hand. Now, uh, I will leave the 5% uh, carried interest. You will notice that we've used a, a very sophisticated term now. Uh, they said this thing, Yako Mandias, Africa carry, is too crude. It's called carried interest. He will, she will explain this. Uh, lawyers feel that the community consultation failed. Now, it's a problem when lawyers become communities and they get paid a fee for being lawyers. It becomes a big problem. We were in 11 mining communities physically. We talked to many people. We met their representative in the drafting process. So we have engaged people as much as we could. So anybody who has a different view uh, has a right to have a different view. It's like, you know, when you go to, to Korobin, the, the biggest slogan is that we have a right to say no. We've accepted that right for people to say no. But we say those who have a right to say no must accept the right of others to say yes. So you can't just have one right, right to say no. You have a right to say yes, you have a right, uh, no, and you have a right to say yes. And if it comes to a push, we're going to test the views of the people of Colombia before we take the next step. Thank you very much. Carried interest, I would answer it, but I think it's more technical for me. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, if you look at the, 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 the final charter that we were releasing today, we have comparing it to the draft that was published in, in June, we have said it's going to be 5% carried interest. Reason for that is we looked at it um, in the business sense, we looked at it legally, strictly speaking, that it is not free. It might be free to the beneficiary, which in this case is going to be communities, but it is not free, but it is rather carried by the empowering partner. And we are saying in the charter, it's carried interest to be financed from the development of the asset. So as the, 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 the mining right holder develops the, the asset, they would then pay off that carried interest. And on the equity equivalent benefit, we're saying it's equivalent of that 5%. It's an option that is there for them, but it's carried interest, and that's what the final um, charter says. Minister, I also want to um, talk about the, the lawyers who took us to court who are saying the engagements were, 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 were um, a failure. I do not think that would be a fair assessment to make because we've engaged extensively with them. In fact, the last meeting we had with them at our offices was on the 17th of September because we said we took a view that they gave us their written submissions by the 31st of August. We looked at their submissions. Remember, it's different lawyers representing different NGOs, representing different communities. So what we did when we received their submissions, we analyzed their submissions and we aligned issues where they were raising similar issues. We tabulated them and we created responses to them. We considered them, we factored them into the charter, and then we said on the 17th, maybe we should call them again, just to give them feedback on how we have looked at their written submissions. And believe you me, 
The outcome of that meeting was very positive. We walked out of that meeting with the lawyers speaking um, in the same tune. And lastly, on the, this, this issue of a secret meeting in Australia, we went there to attend Africa Down Under. Like we do with any other conference, just like we do with Mining Indaba, we would have side meetings scheduled for minister. We receive a hundred, quite a number of requests for companies, investors who are actually uh, already active in, in, in South Africa in the mining space and potential investors who would be requesting um, to meet with the minister. So similarly, at, at, at the Africa Down Under, we had a series of meetings with different investors and potential investors, including, by the way, meeting other mining ministers from different African countries, like Burkina Faso, Senegal, and as we speak, uh, some of our colleagues uh, went to Burkina Faso last night um, as part of a commitment that minister made to the minister um, uh, of mining in Burkina Faso. So there was never really a secret meeting. It's just um, in the ordinary way of us doing business that when we go in, um, to these international platforms, we go there and we do allow space for the minister to engage with uh, investors and potential investors. Thank you. We'll take the second round of questions. We will start in Cape Town uh, this time around. Uh, if Jan yes, and good morning. Have questions? Yes, go Jan ahead. and Marianne, you can go ahead. Jan, Jan Lange from Report Minister. The separate uh, legislation for gas and oil, um, can you give us an indication of how long do you think it's going to take before you will be able to pass that through Poland? Um, I believe there's already quite substantial agreement between the partners for that legislation in the in the MPRDA round that was done. Can you give us an idea when you, when we can expect new legislation? Good morning, Minister Marianne Merton from the Daily Maverick. It's a follow-on uh, question uh, with 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 regards to the MPRDA amendment bill. Um, the bill is not under the control of the ministry, obviously, because it's before Parliament. But have you been in touch with the Chief Whip, the ANC Parliamentary Caucus, the Speaker, or, or, or through the structures here at Parliament? Because uh, uh, last week, Friday, the President did give a commitment that uh, the bill, the amendment bill, would now be withdrawn. Um, what is the, the time frame you're looking at and how soon after this happened would you be able to table either the gas and oil industry legislation or regulation? Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from Cape Town? One more from Gay Davis. Okay. Thanks. Morning, Minister. Gay Davis, Eyewitness News. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wonder if you could just uh, tell me what your view is on splitting uh, oil and gas, uh, uh, putting it back under, putting it under energy uh, ministry. Uh, are you in discussions with the energy minister around that? Is that being talked about in cabinet as a correct way to go? Or do you think that it would be better for oil and gas uh, to remain within mineral resources? Thanks. We'll take two questions from this side. Uh, the guy in the blue shirt and the gentleman with the long hair. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have your name. Thank you. Uh, Felix Njini from uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, could you just clarify uh, with regards to the 5% carried interest? Who, who finances the carried interest? Is, is it the, the companies or... Uh, so if it's the companies, can we, st can we still say it's free carried interest? And on the communities, the, the, the option to develop communities, how, how is that going to work? Can you maybe just give us more details, more, more color on that? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, it's uh, Dewald from City Press. Um, just uh, two questions on the chart. I know we don't have the full version before us, and maybe it'll all be you know, quite evident from there. But um, 
It says here that on the new rights, uh, the BE shareholder can exit after one third of the term of the rights expired, but they have to have uh, made a net gain of some sort before they exit. So what exactly happens in a case where the mine just didn't do very well? Um, would the rest of the owners of the mine be obliged to kind of pay up and make sure they made no loss at least before they leave? I mean, what, what practically happens? Um, we'll take the last round of questions once the minister is, is done with this one. Minister, when you're ready. Uh, I don't think we should be forced to put time frames on this process. Let me tell you why, because we'll have to engage the sector itself in whatever we do. So that process will start once we withdraw those amendments. Um, it should move quite quick and Somebody asked the question, what do we do? Because the MPRDA bill is before Parliament. He said, that's why it's very important to listen when we present. We said, we have written the letter to both the chairperson of the NCOP and the speaker of the National Assembly. And the reason that we make that point is because we know that that process should be managed at that level. So. We've already indicated to them the intention for it to be withdrawn. So the process will be kick-started in Parliament. So I cannot say it will happen next week. Uh, those amendments have been before Parliament since 2013. You see. Uh, uh, we're withdrawing them in 2018. But letters to both the chairperson of the NCOP and the Speaker of Parliament have already gone. So we're actioning that already. Um, you see, petroleum and gas to be transferred to Minister of Energy. I think the worst thing we can do is when we want to establish a, a sector, we start creating a fight on terrains. Uh, it will be a very dangerous issue. But extraction, exploration, fall under DMR. Whether it is oil or gas or mineral, exploration falls under DMR. Once they are processed, they become energy, they go to energy. Now, let's not try to create terrain and some tough battles before we even start working. Our view is that we're working, we're developing that legislation, we are going to take it to the cabinet uh, within a very short space of time, work is already uh, happening in that regard. We'll first declare it interest. Uh, you see, again, person not listening. Togozo can repeat this, that it is called carried interest because it is not free because somebody pays for it. And she explained that the development of that particular mine will carry the cost of the carried interest. So it is free to the beneficiary, but somebody pays for it. That's why we use the term, which is more correct, carried interest, but you can come back to it. Because, uh, I'm leaving the, the, the last question to you, because okay, that a two-third of the period, and what happens, and so forth. But the reality of the matter is that we're moving now, uh, uh, regulatory and policy uncertainty is removed. It cannot be used as an excuse. We have a duty now to go and mobilize investment into mining in the country. Uh, Minister, I think you've covered the, the carried interest question quite eloquently, so I will not be repeating that. 
On the question about a mining right holder who does not meet the required uh, BE um, shareholding percentage, I mean, that's just, a, that's a plain non-compliance. And where there is non-compliance, we deal with those issues in terms of the non-compliance provisions in the MPRDA. We would not be saying we recognize you when you never complied. The recognition is for those who have met the targets, who have complied, who have fully complied. If you never fully complied for the duration of your right, we will be um, um, pursuing um, that right holder to then comply and meet the requirements. We'll take a final round of questions. I'll start with John there at the back, and then this John here in front, and then the two gentlemen at the back there. Thank you. May I go? Yes, go. <laughs> okay. Sure. Hi. I'm, I'm pleased we're on first name terms. I'm John Clark. I'm here actually wearing the hat, Minister, as correspondent for the the, the, the Southern Cross, which is a Catholic newspaper, so I'm not here in, in a, a capacity as an activist. I'm here as a journalist and as a writer. Uh, well, I was there at Kolobeni uh, on Sunday. We met. And my concern is that after that event, one of my clients as a social worker working in that community for the last 12 years, who happens to be, in fact, in the ANC, so I'm not talking about any factional politics, he's somebody from the community, phoned me to say, John, can you please make a submission to the Commission for State Capture? Because as they are hearing all the stories coming out about what's happening in the State Capture Commission, there is a desire for them to make submissions too about how over, from the last 10 years, we've seen the same incipient process of state capture at work to basically silence the local community, to marginalize them, and to go with people with deeply vested interests. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to work, but I, what I would want to ask you is, would you be prepared to a process of truth and reconciliation to be facilitated independently by people from outside who are neutral to the conflict, so that we can get back to looking at the question of whether mining is, in fact, a sustainable option in that community. Of course, I have my reservations. It's not up to me, but I thoroughly agree with you that, of course, the right to say no and the right to say yes must be respected. Social workers are there to uphold the Bill of Rights and to promote engagement and participation of people of most vulnerable and disadvantaged, especially in decisions that affect them. And I've written a book about this. I've written to you. I've I've written reports to Collins Chibani, the late minister, about what was happening. These have been suppressed. These have not been put into the public domain. And, and now we're seeing our lawyer arrested. We are not seeing, seeing the rule of law. We are seeing a, the horrible sense of the rule by law, the rule, the overreaching by the police, where they have a, a hammer and they treat everything as if it's a nail. And they have now caused, uh, unfortunately for you, a bigger problem, and I really was here to hopefully see us in, in a new dawn where the mining industry would start embracing the lessons from the past instead of trying to shut people up and, and continue the oppressive processes that we saw under apartheid. Um, John Fraser? Yeah, Minister John Fraser, ZA Confidential. I, I have a question. Um, could, could you just clarify uh, the demarcation between your department and the Department of Energy on oil and gas, because I'm afraid I was slightly confused by your earlier answer. The two gentlemen at the back there. Hello, I'm Robert Krauss, Center for Applied Legal Studies. I'm from the organization as one of the legal representatives. And while I will, I will certainly concur that the, that the last meeting was a, was a very was a very congenial meeting, there were there were a number of very serious problems with the process that we as lawyers didn't suggest, but which were actually communicated to us in all provinces by, by our clients, which are networks, Mechcon, Makura, Mura, community networks in multiple provinces. So just as a point of clarity, we didn't invent this. This, this, this came directly from, from our clients, but that is not the question. I have a question about two areas of, of that weren't discussed related to the charter. The one is I've heard reports that the, the provisions in the, in the previous draft for 
community and worker representation on advisory boards and companies has been has, has been removed from from this version of the charter is 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 is, is that is that correct and and and, and my second question relates to social social and labor plans i maybe i wasn't listening correctly but just a point of clarity does the new mine charter specify a required minimum percentage of turnover by which companies should contribute to social and labor plans as was the case with um, the 2017 mining charter. Thank you. Um, the lady in the front here. Yeah. Good morning, Minister, distinguished panel. My name is Ernst Miller. I'm from Herbert Smith Freehills. Just a, a, a further question. Um, I think it's very clear who is responsible to um, fit the bill for the carried interest. My question flows from that. Um, when when would the shares transfer to the employees in the host communities and when will the benefits vest in these communities? Seeing as the mining companies will be responsible to fit these bills, will the shares only transfer once the, the, the value of the shares has been paid for or will it happen immediately? Thank you. Um, the last question at the front here. Hi, Minister. My name is Mia Slubbard. I'm from Marula Media. Um, when it comes to, oh, I'd just like to get a definition from you uh, when it comes to employee uh, shareholders in company, qualifying employees when it comes to shareholder schemes in companies, and specific when it comes to Sussel. We know there's a lot of stuff going on in the media uh, with Sussel at the moment. If, can we just have a clear definition of that? I would really appreciate that. Thanks, Minister. Uh, you see, John, uh, it's always difficult to deal with a person who changes as he likes. Uh, he becomes an activist in the community, takes it off, he becomes a journalist, he becomes something else. It's always confusing to deal with that situation. The people, the Commission on State Capture is ongoing. Uh, people do not ask permission for me what to take there. People can take anything to that commission as they like, anytime. It's established, it is working, it is there, it is listening to everybody. So if people want to go there, they can go. Now, I don't know the truth and reconciliation. We did the TRC many years ago. If you want another TRC, uh, it's something else. Uh, I don't have control over that. Uh, a lawyer arrested, police using that, you know. I always know my responsibility and I know where my authority starts and where it ends. I don't command police. Uh, the minister of police is a gentleman who is always having a head called Becky Gale. Now, if there is anything about the behavior of the police, that is the person to talk to. Or IPID is uh, responsible for looking into the behavior of the police. So I have no control over that. But the issue is there is Olobeni is the least developed. You know that. You have been there. It's not developed at all. So the issue of whether there is this right or that right is academic. The place is not developed as we sit here today. Uh, so uh, from where I'm seated, I think that area needs development. And that development should be a combination of many initiatives. One is the N2. Uh, N2 will give people access to Kolobin. As we go now, you know, I use both routes to Kolobin on Sunday. The one that goes all the way to Bizana is a little bit better. The one that goes straight to Port Edward is bad. So one, those roads, those access roads must be developed. Uh, and they will contribute to the development of Kolobin. Two, a mine in that area will contribute to the development. Tourism will only be flourishing when there's access. And, and, and that's it. 
And my own view is that engagement on those issues, I am ready for that engagement from whoever. If you have a group that want to engage me, I'm ready for that group. Uh, uh, you can give the, the crisis comment, you can bring anybody. I will talk to them, I will explain my views. And I think one of the things that we should be helping people in Kolobini is not to throw conflict at them, divide them. Which I think is something that is happening, people are dividing them. We must talk to them and appreciate the fact that they must coexist, they must engage, they must talk to each other. Uh, you were there on Sunday. Uh, you listen to us saying everybody must come to the meeting, sit down, express views in the meeting. But I'm sure as a correspondent, you are not going to write that a group of school going kids in a corner sang at top of their voice disrupting a meeting. You won't report that because it is not in line with your interests. But that was the reality. All people that have been bullied for years need protection. Because those people filled that tent, they expressed their views. Many said, for the first time, do they get an opportunity to talk for themselves. You cannot have a, a, a community that is bullied and intimidated into silence. It can't work. It, it can't work and we have a responsibility to ensure that it doesn't happen. We must open up, people must talk to one another there. If you have a group that wants to talk to us, we are ready to talk to them, anytime. Demarcation between energy and, and DMR. Let me give you the example. When we mine coal, we do exploration, we extract, but once coal gets into a conveyor belt, it goes to ESCOM, it becomes energy. The demarcation is on the conveyor belt. That's the easier example that can make you understand that demarcation, that energy and mining are actually in one value chain. Where do you cut mining in the value chain? I can tell you that we don't want to be in the processing of uh, petroleum into petrol or diesel or anything. We have an interest in extraction, we have an interest in exploration, that is our responsibility. Once it comes out, it gets into processing, value addition, in the value chain, it goes to energy. So I think the coal example is the simplest way of illustrating the boundary. Uh, serious problem, uh, no. One thing about Makua, who was uh, talking for Makua? Represented groups, Makua, and all of them. Makua, for example, and Okwa, is it Okwa or Odwa? Those com community organizations, they were in every meeting we had in the level mining communities. And they expressed their views, they made their submission, they gave us what they call the People's Charter. They have been to all 11 of them. So my own view is that if you, 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 you engage them, they will tell you that they were given all the opportunities to, to, to contribute in the process. Uh, representation in the boards. Representation in the board was never in any charter. It was never in any charter. What we are saying, once we accept the principle of uh, ownership and shareholding, we must look into the possibility of workers and communities having seats in the board. Our view is that that's not a charter issue, it's an execution issue. We'll still pursue that issue. Uh, for, for workers, I sat in a number of boards. When I was in the union, I sat in the ESCOM board, I sat in Samango board, uh, and it was not an issue of a charter, it was an issue of unions that are actually understanding the importance of being part of decision making and meaningful influence decisions. This falls in that category. Uh, SLPs, will you talk about that in Kondogoso? And the shares being transferred, you'll talk to that. Employee shareholder scheme and so on. 
employee shareholder schemes we have experiences. ESCOM is but one, session is another. There are quite a few experiences of ESOPs, how they are managed. It is not the share value that is transferred, it is the dividend. Because if you distribute share value, you give it away, you are actually removing that shareholder from being a shareholder. What is actually distributed is dividends uh, based on the performance of the company. And therefore, shareholders will not be removed. They must remain there and be part of the company forever. That's why we say it doesn't matter whether you increase your, your, your capital, you mobilize new capital, don't dilute that 5%. That's what we say in the charter. So that shareholding must translate into dividend flow. Douglas? Now, the, the question as to whether we have a, a certain percentage of turnover set to fund the SLPs. We do not have that in the charter. What we've agreed on as the team is that as we are currently sitting developing the implementation plan or the guidelines that Minister referred to, we've agreed that we are going to put all those modalities in the guidelines. And what we will be doing in the next, over the next two weeks is we are going to be engaging with our stakeholders again um, just to hear their views on what they see as possible ways for implementation of this charter. That's the approach we've taken. And as soon as that uh, process um, and the lawyers uh, representing communities will be part of that process, they will be um, invited um, for engagements on the, the implementation tool. And one other thing though, we felt that while we will have the, the modalities in the guidelines, we are also considering amending the regulations to the MPRDA. And that's where, again, we have space to then specify the modalities as to how exactly that is going to be done. Now, the question about vesting uh, for communities, again, in the guidelines, in the implementation guidelines, we're going to engage the different stakeholders and agree on terms and timelines and um, reporting and, 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 and. But that is a process that we're looking at concluding over the next two weeks. We will be sending out letters inviting our stakeholders, the unions, um, the mining uh, sector, uh, community representatives, um, all the interested and affected parties that we've engaged throughout this process, we are going to be engaging with them over the next two weeks on the modalities for implementation. We have the draft framework already. What we're going to be doing is just to consult with them, consider their views, and we will finalize the modalities for implementation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of today's media briefing. The final Gazetted Charter will be circulated electronically and posted on our website once it's up from the government printers. Thank you very much for joining us.